two of three. Brill, 10 seconds away, I think. Oh, some great questions here. Hi and welcome. Um, welcome to the live Q and A um, for today. Searching uh, for facts. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the interview uh, with Timothy Cho um, and the talk by Niv. Um, and now I'd also like to thank Niv for joining us for the Q and A. Um, I'm going to give us a few moments um, for people to get over from um, the premiere over to the live uh, live stream, and then we'll uh, get underway. Um, while we wait for people, uh, I would highly recommend looking in the description for the contact form. Um, uh, I'd like to remind people that if we don't have time to get to your question um, in this Q&A, that the best thing that you can do is go to the contact form. You can ask it through there if, it, if you really have a specific question you want answering. Otherwise, I highly recommend um, you sign up to one of the courses that will be running. Um, Mondays with Mark um, is a big one, and so is Curious Cafe. Um, and then also, if you want something a bit more intimate, you can also sort out a one-to-one -one with someone from the CU, um, and then we'll get you in contact with someone and get that going, and that can work however you want, want it to go. Um, it looks like we've got a fair few people over now. Um, so uh, thank you, Nif, for joining us. Great to be here. Um, really enjoying this week. Great. Um, so in the live chat over on... Um, the premiere we had a brilliant array of questions asked um but quickly i would like to say if you want to ask any more questions please do put them on the slido that is the best way for us to to see them and interact with them um and if you really like a question that you see on there please do thumbs it up um and then the ones at the top will be the ones that we tackle first we'll quickly deal with the ones on um on the live chat um mm -hmm. and then we'll move over to the slido um so yeah, we've got a brilliant, brilliant selection of questions here um, that all sort of follow a similar theme. Um, I know you're raring to tackle the nib. Um, so uh, yeah, okay, I've got to start with it. Well, didn't the victimization of Christianity pretty much flip once Constantine made it the official religion of the Roman Empire um, and then carrying on with the flow? Um, I don't think that just because of religious, um, I think standards of what they mean, uh, what they believe that it makes um, what they believe is true. Um, the world is replete with suicidal salads and mysterious cults. I don't know if that's the phrase that they were going for. Um, I've never heard that before. But Great. Should I, should I have a go at those two quickly now and then you yeah. can do the rest? Thank you for those questions. Really fun. Please do use the Slido if while we're, we're trying to answer them, you feel like your question wasn't quite as expressed as you'd like. And thanks again. I love your questions. OK, so didn't the victimization of Christianity pretty much flip when we got to Constantine? That's a bit of a simplification. In many ways, uh, Constantine definitely overturned some of the persecution of Christianity that was happening. But it wasn't until Theodosius later that century that Christianity actually became the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's important to note because we want to get our facts straight, don't we? Um, 
what's really important about those that though is is it actually raises more questions than it solves you may think to yourself simple constantine boom you've then got all of christianity um and, and, and it's kushti well in a way it kind of isn't there are loads of places that were christian which um stopped being christian when islam rose or various other things so the survival of christianity is not just a, a matter of power but the really big question it raises is this how on earth does Christianity go from being something like a handful of scared people in an upper room in Jerusalem whose leader has just been executed to then being in such a position of power and credibility that Constantine realizes he can yoke his empire and imperial hopes to this movement? this tiny movement, who, by the way, were not popular at the time and were not trying to be popular because they pinned their hopes to a man who'd been nailed to a cross. And that was just counterintuitive on every level in the ancient world. Um, so that's a really important question. If you think dropping the pin at, um, I don't know, 312 and the victory of Constantine is, is sorting everything out for you, you then have just about three centuries that you have to explain. So that doesn't really answer the question for us. Secondly, and, and more to the point, this question of don't people just um, die for what they believe? There are plenty of people prepared to commit suicide uh, for what they believe. That's true. Of course it's true. Uh, loads of people around the world are prepared to die for what they believe. But here's the thing when it comes to people who claim to be witnesses witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. They weren't just claiming, uh, so they weren't just dying for something they said they believed. They were dying for something that if it didn't actually happen, they knew for sure was false. And tell me where you find that. Uh, Pascal, who I hope you would imperial really like because he was a brilliant scientist and mathematician, wrote in one of his pensées, and I'm paraphrasing here, followed out to the end. You have these uh, 11 apostles, uh, you know, these, these early figures in Christianity who claim to have seen Jesus rise from the dead. All it would have taken was one of them to break, one of them to say, didn't really happen, we're just making it up. All it would have taken was that one, and then the whole thing would have fallen apart. And this is important to note, uh, as our questioner himself has pointed out, before Constantine, Christians had none of the power, none of the authority. They didn't have an amazing hand to play. They had a dead man, right? That's all they had to work with. Now, if um, what had happened to Jesus uh, is as they, they said it was, that he was raised from the dead. That explains why they took the measures they did, why they had the courage they did to face death, as many of them did, for standing by their message. So it's not the same as people today prepared to give up their lives for what they believe to be true. Because if you're saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what you're actually saying is that people in great numbers were prepared to suffer and die for something they knew for sure was false. And if you're prepared to believe that, then I think you're more credulous than you should be. Um, a second point on this, which is very important, which is that there were other messianic movements and clearly the questioner has some awareness of them. But because you have that awareness, you will know that something happens when the lead of a messianic movement dies, which is that leadership is then passed on to another figure in the movement, usually in the family. What is so fascinating about Christianity is that that does not happen, even though there is an amazing candidate and his name is uh, James. He is one of the brothers of Jesus. He's clearly an authority and leader in early Christianity, and yet he never becomes a messiah. There's only one uh, letter in the Bible that, that he writes. Um, and despite his, his undoubted authority status, he actually is not a kind of key player in terms of salvation. Only Jesus is the one the Christians start proclaiming. So if you know all these things about the messianic um, movements that you have in, in Second Temple Judaism, then you should really be asking yourself the question, why all the differences here? Why adopt the defeat of your messianic figure as your moment of victory? And why proclaim that as not just some kind of really slick PR move? Why proclaim that as the fulfillment of all your hopes? Uh, and here's one final thing on that. This all happens really quickly. Right? Within a matter of years, Christians are redefining many of the expectations around what Messiah should have been in order to proclaim Jesus this way. I've just finished a theology degree and I can tell you, and you'll know this, I'm sure, that intellectual history is full of things that take ages to develop, that the speed is glacial as ideas develop and develop over time. What on earth do we do to explain this slew of sudden and convincing ideas that wasn't come up with by people in ivory academic towers, but actually a bunch of people who at the time were written off as illiterate, or not illiterate, but you know, people without the right kind of education. There's a real mystery here. Uh, and some of the questions you're raising actually raise these questions at a greater level of intensity. Mm, that's a brilliant answer. I think as we can see through the discussion that's going on in the live chat um, and from your answer there, uh, it all hinges on Christ. He is the key center to it all. Um, and so just looking further at some of the additional stuff below. Um, 
Since Rome's adaptation, Christianity has been spread more through imperial and colonial violence than by the truths or values of its merits. Um, Jesus wasn't also the first person to teach sort of criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already sort of tackled that, uh, that next one, I think. Yeah, no, these are great questions. So in terms yeah. of the imperial uh, claims of Christianity, it's certainly true that many, uh, that, that, that many occasions in which Christianity has spread, there have been moments in which, yes, you can say that there, there's been violence involved, but that's not the whole story. In this country, you can look at plenty of missionary movements that happened with lots of monks with funny sounding names who were actually really suffering to take the message of Jesus where they went. And it wasn't with imperial power that they went. And in fact, um, the, the, the colonial history of this country is, is often a cause of shame, but the missionary movement can't be simplistically understood as just an expansion of the empire. Often you had missionaries really impatient with empire because imperial purposes were just trying to get money and acquire things, but the missionaries were trying to honor the dignity and humanity of the people in all these different places. Of course, we might have done things differently ourselves, but I think it would be too naive to say that their motives were all flat. There was another really promising bit of question there about wasn't Jesus basically just saying the same ethical stuff everyone else was? Now, there's a degree of truth to this in that Jesus is saying a lot of stuff that a lot of other people say, because as we've covered in the past couple of nights, there are such things as objective moral standards. And so it's not surprising that lots and lots of people uh, live them out. At the same time, you do not have the same kind of social agenda that Jesus promotes. And one of the questioners on the live chat said, you know, these are basic humanist values. Ask yourself, where do humanist values come from? And if you say to yourself, well, well they come from Confucius or someone like that, that's actually not quite right. The Stoics and the Confucian sort of systems don't talk about equality the way we do. They don't talk about justice the way that we do today if we're humanists. And that's because humanism has been formed in the West as a result of a Christian inheritance. Um, and if you're thinking, Niv, that's just a huge claim, please go and read Tom Holland and his book, Dominion, which is a brilliant study of how this developed in history. If you think Tom Holland's too popular level, although you shouldn't because he's an excellent historian, um, you could also look at the works of someone like Larry Seedentop. He's also an Oxford academic, brilliant figure to look at. Um, or, or someone like Alistair McIntyre to, to really name one of the big daddies in philosophy here. Um, actually, it's, it's a pretty well recognized fact that what we consider humanist values have a distinctive Judeo-Christian background. Um, so to say Jesus just preached the humanist values is it, actually um, putting the cart before the horse. We only have such values because of his impact. Yeah. I can also highly recommend the Dominion book as well. I've also read that. Um, it is a really fascinating read. Um, especially when you see that Tom Holland himself might have, he had a Christian upbringing um, to an extent, but I don't think he himself considers himself a Christian now at this point. Yeah. And no, so he's coming from a fairly neutral standpoint. Um, yeah. Well, as neutral as, as you can get um, from that. Yeah. Um, now moving over to the Slido, um, there's a really popular question here. Um, people often become Christians out of suffering and desperation. Um, says, I'm not suffering and I don't, I don't want to become a Christian, so why should I be a Christian? Oh, these Very are great questions. Question. Really like that one. And can I just say, I want to apologise in advance if Christians have only told you stories of hurt and brokenness leading to life in Jesus, because actually that's not the whole story of Christianity. Um, it is true that all of us are going to experience hard times, and it is true that Christianity speaks to those times with unparalleled riches, and that's what we're thinking about tomorrow. But at the same time, the Bible does not say this is only for you if you're already going through a hard time. The Bible isn't just for people who are um, feeling miserable. Actually, if you are enjoying life, if there are good things in your life, Christianity is for you because Christianity tells you that you can meet the giver of all these gifts. And if the gifts are good and you're enjoying them, how much better would your enjoyment of them be if you met the one who made them and gave them to you? How much better would life be if you discovered the love that could make sense of you and everything you care about? So if you say to yourself, you know, I, I'm not suffering right now, that's fine. Are you happy right now? Ask yourself where that happiness comes from. And what if I told you you could have more? That's the promise Jesus makes. A couple of nights ago, we think about one of the miracles where Jesus turns water into wine. That's the point of that story. Think you're happy? I think things are going well. Great. I'm really glad to hear that. And I'm not hoping that your life falls apart, that you meet Jesus. You don't have to. You can meet Jesus in the joys. Uh, one writer talks about it as tracing the sunbeam back up to the sun. And if you ask me, that is a really exciting thing because it tells you that the good things in life that you enjoy are not just things that trigger hormones in your body uh, or whatever. They, they, they do that, sure. But behind that and beyond that, they are gifts from a God who made you, uh, who loves you. They're, 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 they're signposts towards an even greater joy than the one you experience in them. 
And that's a really amazing way to think about life. Um, yeah, great question. Oh, sorry, the final bit was, why should I become a Christian? And I, I think that's a different question again. And the answer is because it's the right thing to do. If this God made you and he cares about you, um, then of course, turning away from him is a terribly wrong thing to do. And of course, um, you and I all morally need help when it comes to the ways we've fallen short. So you should become a Christian, uh, not just as a crutch for things going wrong, and not even just as a you know, bringer of greater joys of things going well, but because this is the God who made you and made you for himself. Um, in a very striking way, you and I belong to him. Um, so yeah, return to him is, is one of the things the Bible's saying. Yeah, it's the right thing to do. If I can just add to that in terms of why should you be a Christian, and um, th these are topics that we will be exploring in some of the earlier mentioned courses, um, uh, Curious Cafe, uh, Mondays with Mark. And again, in a one-to-one, -one, you can question that all you like um, with a member of the CEU. Um, so I do highly encourage you guys to get in contact with the CEU if you really want to explore why we think you should be a Christian and just explore the Bible and the Gospels in, in general to see what you make of it and come to your own mm -hmm. conclusions. Um, now, again, like, there are some really popular questions um, here. Um, the next one is, how did the theologians, and so I guess they mean the early church as well in this, know which manuscripts were accurate and should be included in the Bible? A great question. And again, this ties into some of the stuff people often talk about with Constantine, that there's this sense in which all the Christians sit down, they've got this kind of big pile of manuscripts and they kind of go, yes, we like that one, we like that one. Oh, that one's a bit awkward, put it to the side. Um, and, and that, by the way, is, is a seedbed for all sorts of conspiracy theories. Uh, so if you like reading terrible, terrible novels, and I don't, because why would you? Uh, you could read some Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. And I remember when I was a child, <laughs> that was big. And I remember as a child, I, th I think I was an atheist when that point, book came out. And I was like, brilliant, there you go. The problem with that is that it's not just bad literature, it's also really bad history. That's not how it happened at all. Yes, it's true that in the fourth century, you have Christians coming out with um, full lists of what books are in the Bible, but they're not doing that as a kind of first move to say, all right, guys, let's get it straight. Um, actually, for the centuries beforehand, you have plenty of these texts being quoted and quoted as authoritative and treated as the standard by which people um, judge the, the, the truth of, of the Christian faith. Um, and so what happens in the fourth century is a recognizing. They're not conferring authority on these texts. They're recognizing the authority that these texts have had for a very long time. Now, if you're interested in the history of this, um, the, the process really gets spicy in the second century with a chap called Marcion who gets out his scissors and cuts up the Bible to take out all the bits he doesn't like. Uh, that's something Thomas Jefferson does in um, the 18th century. But anyway, um, so Marcion does that. And up until that point, Christians have not really needed to get together and say, these are the books that are in the Bible. Um, when Marcion does that, he's crossed a line. And so Christians do have to start doing that. And they come out with something called the Muratorian Fragment, which you can look up. It's a fragment, so it doesn't tell us everything we want, but it lists many of the books that are in the New Testament. And so what's going on there is a process of um, sort of dialogue with people who want to take bits out of the Bible and Christians say, you can't do that. Um, and it's, yeah, so, so if you're interested, do chase that whole uh, process out. But what you don't have is a sort of conspiracy theory thing. You have a recognition thing. People saying, these are the texts that the churches have taken seriously. This is what's been handed down to us. This is what we're going to work with. Any response? Um, uh, so then another popular question is, if religion is based on faith, why do people care so much about the truth? Surely the point of religion is faith, which has no absolute truth. Yeah, it's a fun question. And um, to be honest, if, if religion is based in faith, then maybe that's right. But here at Imperial uh, CU, people are not actually trying to make you religious. That's just not the kind of biggest goal that the Christian Union has. Um, this, this group is all about the change Jesus makes in your life and knowing him um, is what's going on. And if we're going to call that religion, then that's fine. But um, I think the terms of the question show how difficult it is to figure out what Jesus adds. So what we're talking about is knowing Jesus, who, who is God come to meet us. And therefore, faith is not us closing our eyes and blindly believing uh, six impossible things before breakfast. What it is, is trust a personal trust, trusting someone. I hope that makes sense. And I hope that begins to show why reason and evidence are really important. If faith is trusting a person, then you need to have good reason to trust them. Otherwise, what are you? I guess, gullible and easy to mislead. Uh, you know, think about any of the more meaningful relationships in your life. Of course, you love these people. Of course, you trust them. But you don't 
just trust them. Behind that is built loads of reasons why you trust them, the way they've treated you, the things they've done for you, the things they mean to you. That's how we form relationships. Now, when it comes to Jesus, the same is true. And that's why a week like this is so full of evidence. Um, it, it's not because coming to know Jesus is this moment where you just leap into the dark. And people have said it's, it's more like a leap into the light as you see what Jesus is offering and realize he isn't just kind of making this stuff up. And it's not just propaganda that Christians have come out with. It's actually claims that come from him that he was prepared to die for and then rise again to, to show you that you can have this. It can be yours. And so for that reason, uh, reason matters. And by the way, if this is faith in the God who made us come to meet us in Jesus, um, then he also made everything else. He made the world we live in. He made our minds. It would be crazy for a relationship with him to somehow mean binning your brain and just blindly believing uh, what you were told. Um, so faith is not just shutting your eyes to evidence. Faith in Christian terms is trusting a person, trusting Jesus. Um, and that, by the way, is why we don't know everything, because we're trusting him. And so that faith means that our knowledge of, of everything is going to be provisional. We're going to learn more the further we go with him. Um, but, but it's because it's trusting a person. Uh, that means that, yes, reason, evidence, it's all important stuff and it does matter. Um, a final bit, the question says, faith which has no absolute truth. How do you define absolute truth? The revolutionary answer of Christianity is that truth is a person, a person who made everything and therefore has given coherence to reality such that you can do maths and call that truth, such that you can explore history and call that truth. All truth ultimately is found in him. So come to meet him and then you discover how faith and absolute truth actually do go together. Uh, do go together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, brilliant answer. Um, I apologize, apologize about the start when my um, housemate knocked on my door. <laughs> um, that's all fine and sorted now. Um, so again, these questions are really popular at the moment. A lot of likes coming on. Um, I get that 30 to 40 years is little enough time to remember par particular stories, but how would they be able to remember Jesus' exact words so many years later? Hmm. Really good question. I don't know about you, but my memory is pretty bad. So the idea that I have to remember what was said last week is pretty intimidating, let alone 30 to 40 years. Um, but I think the point that this question makes us face is this. We are different people from people in the ancient world. And there are a few differences here that we need to think about seriously. So firstly, what wasn't happening was Jesus teaching, dying, rising again, and then 30 to 40 years pass. And in between, they're not thinking about this stuff. They're not talking about this stuff, just, you know, whatever. Um, no, in between, they are talking about this stuff all the time. They are saying this stuff to one another. They're teaching this stuff to one another. They're very likely writing it down because that might be part of the, um, the, the way they start um, tracing the history of Jesus and, and collating these accounts. Um, so, so what you don't have is people like being put on the spot and be saying, 30 years ago, what did he say? Um, this is someone who spent these 30 years sharing these um, stories and, and doing so in a community with other people who can correct you and say no no I was there that's not how it happened um, and so these traditions grow secondly though and much more important we are different people in that theirs was an oral culture ours is a written culture these days we don't really do memorizing things uh, because Google does it all for you you know if you've got a question go to Wikipedia what's the point of learning dates what's the point of learning facts what's the point of learning quotes it's all, it's all there um, I'm being a bit silly there and facetious but the point is we don't really put a great stock on memory not the same back then Literacy was a thing, of course it was, but they were an oral culture. And in oral cultures that people can study today, anthropologists and others do, um, you find an astonishing degree of accuracy in recall between generations, right? So that three generations later, the, 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 the substance of, of, of a sometimes very long piece of, of, um, of, of tradition is, is accurate verbatim. Now, what we're actually claiming with Christianity is not this is the next generation. We're saying within the same generation, you've got these writings. And so there's no need, no reason to worry. If you're asking, you know, where's all this um, coming from? The, the work of scholarship that's very helpful here is called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Borkham. He's a professor studying in, in specializing in these things. I think he's been based at St. Andrews and Cambridge and other places like that. Um, and this book is brilliant. So if you're interested in these questions of oral culture and memory, um, please go check it out. And I think what you'll find in there is, is really enlightening. Mm, it's fascinating how different the society we live in today is from yeah. the ancient world and how that plays into how we have to look at these things and how context can play a big part in our understanding. Yeah. Mm. Um, now we've got a question that is primarily directed at you, Niv. Um, and that's, how did you become a Christian? Thank you. That's a, that's a privilege to answer that question. Um, yeah. So for me, the subject matter of tonight's talk is probably the reason why I, I was an atheist 
Um, and I was raised by very loving uh, parents. They were Christians themselves and we went to church a lot. But the truth is, I just never believed it. It never meant anything for me personally. It was just church was just the thing you did. And it was kind of like drama. I was an altar boy. So I used to wear like robes and carry <laughs> candles. And, and to me, being allowed to play with fire was kind of OK. You know, I was, I'd let that happen and let everything else wash over me. Um, until I went to school in London, really competitive school, this was around the time when, you know, the new atheism, as they call it, you know, Chris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, et cetera, was starting to become a big thing. Um, I, I, I just went to school where people were very academic and competitive and Christianity or religion in general was just really stupid. Like, why would you believe this? It's just obvious the Bible's wrong. Look at the science. Um, look at the way we, we live in terms of standards and morality. Um, and I think it became very clear to me in that environment that I just didn't believe Christianity. It just wasn't for me. Um, and so I just, you know, sort of mentally checked out of any of the Christian things my family did. Um, and, and it didn't mean anything to me. So I became a Christian in my mid-teens, so a few years after, um, through something that at the time felt like a coincidence, although at the moment I'd say it was God. Um, and it was doing some English homework. Um, please don't hate me for that. I know you guys don't study <laughs> trashy subjects like English, but, you know, it's what I did at university for my first degree. Um, there was a cross reference to John's Gospel, the book that we're looking at this week. And chapter eight, verse 58, uh, Jesus says before Abraham was born, I am, which is really bad grammar. And yet is also demonstrating that Jesus is talking about himself in a way that grammar cannot capture. Because even though it's bad grammar, it makes sense. He's somehow talking as someone who is present even in the past. Uh, to whom all of time is 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 present at every instant, and he is. And I remember being like just blown away by that, and thinking this is a really cool fictional character. Imagine my surprise when the more I read John's Gospel and the more I looked at what scholarship said about it, uh, the more I discovered that Jesus was not a fictional character. No reputable historian, like I said earlier, uh, thinks that he was. Uh, his his existence in history is is um, too well established to deny. And so, as I engaged with this evidence. Um, it all came down to me to whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Um, if that was false, if he didn't, then the whole thing was wrong. And if it was true, then the whole thing was right. Um, and Christianity has a very, uh, I think, kind way of, of confronting the seeker there. So it's not one of those things where it's, oh, it's all a bit of a mystery. You know, you've got to sort of feel it maybe. Like, it's possible for this to be falsified, um, which I know in, in, in science is something you guys will understand as an important aspect of a theory when you when you put it out there. This is falsifiable. Um, so I did my best to falsify it. And uh, I couldn't. You might think to yourself, fine, that's just because you're, you're a bit dim. That's all right. You, you, do, you do it yourself. Go do um, the, the, the work yourself. Look at the evidence for Jesus' resurrection and see what you make of it. Engage with the serious scholarship. By the way, this should surprise you. There is serious scholarship debating this, right? This is about a guy dying and then rising again. There shouldn't be a debate about this, right? That's what atheist me thought. This, this should be an open and shut case. That doesn't happen. Why is it that there are actual debates? Why is it that trained historians, philosophers, um, etc., are prepared to take up the cause against what should be so obvious? So to do that, exploring for yourself. But if you do, what you might find is what happened to me, which is that this stopped being just intellectual for me, as well as being something that was true or false. It also became something that was beautiful um and and i wanted it because what i discovered with jesus was not just someone stepping in saying i have truth for your big questions about reality someone saying i know you and i love you and i've come to deal with all the mess in your life i've come to make sense of all the issues you have um and i've come to show you life and one of the things he says in john's gospel life to the full um, Christianity is not just about answering hard questions in life. It's not even just about, you know, finding comfort for times that are hard. Um, it's knowing Jesus, the most wonderful person there's ever been. And yeah, I, I, I couldn't do anything but um, trust him. But the more the more it became clear to me. Sorry, there's more I could say. I don't want to be self-indulgent, but um, that's basically the long and short of it. And I became a Christian around my mid-teens and ever since then have been learning a lot more have been um, growing a lot. I still feel like I don't really know as much as I could, um, but it's it's been delightful and I wish I'd done it sooner. And I would encourage you to do it yourself. Such a wonderful story. And in terms of that, um, going in and you guys searching for this yourselves, um, Niv was talking a lot about John's gospel there. Um, and that is exactly what um, we're exploring in Curious Cafe. Um, for over the course of this term, um, they'll be meeting on Mondays and looking through slowly each part of it and so you'll be able to make all these discoveries for yourself and already see what you can take away from it. Um, uh, 
Now, we're going to keep the Q&A going on a bit longer. We've got so many wonderful questions. Um, I'm here uh, as long as you like. Can... Great. Um, so, yeah, while, while we've still got you guys, um, why does God let all that evil happen in North Korea? Obviously, it's relating um, to the talk. Yeah, the yeah. Um, and tomorrow night, we're thinking about big questions of suffering. So please come back to that then. Um, as a little trailer, I want to say two things. Firstly, um, when God gives people agency and an ability to act, he really entrusts us with that. And so the decisions we make matter and the way we treat people matters. Um, and he doesn't step in to change things every time we do something wrong. And if we wanted him to, we wouldn't be asking for God to make us real humans. We'd be asking for him to make us puppets, really, to take away any sense of real agency. Now, God who gives us the freedom to treat one another the way we choose um, is a God who um, need, needs to do something about that. And the good news is he will. Uh, one of the things Christians have always said is that uh, Jesus dying and rising again is not the end of the story. He returns to restore a broken world and to deal with injustice and to give everyone what they deserve. Um, so that's one aspect. The second aspect is this, and it's really a trailer for tomorrow, which is um, Timothy has asked that question far, far more than any of us have, hasn't he? This isn't academic for him. This is a matter of family and life and so on. Um, and I think uh, he, he's someone I, I know a little bit. I, I'm not going to pretend to speak for him. But I think one of the, the places that Christians get to is that we don't have all the answers to a question like that. But in Jesus, we do have what we need. So come tomorrow night, and I won't say more, and hear what that is. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. Tomorrow's talk and, and interview are both very intriguing I, I have already seen a little bit of them so i can i can highly recommend that um the next question is do you think the message of the bible is worth losing everything for and i think you can answer this quite simply to be fair yeah no i do um and i and i do and i'm not alone in that there are plenty of people today who are doing that did you know christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world in this country we don't think that because christianity has enjoyed real privilege in the past but it's simply not the case that that's true all over the world so there are christians today who are taking the decision to suffer and lose everything um, it wasn't long ago that it was the anniversary of 21 cops who were beheaded by isis uh, in libya and uh, they thought so um, so i guess the real question is why would anyone do that I mean, these are people who have the internet they have all these th you know figure it out why would they do that and the answer is that when you lose everything for jesus you don't actually lose anything in the end uh, one of the things that jesus says is anyone who uh, tries to save his life will lose it anyone who loses it for my sake will keep it and that the, the idea there is that if you hold on to everything you've got because you're afraid of jesus taking away from you what will happen is you realize in the end you have nothing left death will rob you of all of it before everything else does but if you let go of it for Jesus and follow him the way that leads to the cross, guess what? You discover everything that you thought you left behind and more because he's the one who made it and gave it to you. And as you follow him through uh, the, the footsteps that leads to the cross and then the empty tomb, uh, you realize that he's able to give what no one can take away and no one can threaten. That is a profound security. Discover it and it will not threaten you to lose things the way it did before. Mm. Great answer. Um, uh, just being a bit conscious of time, I'm going to do two more questions here. Um, they're quite different, so I'll, I'll, we'll take them one at a time, I think. Um, the first one is, is a really powerful one. Um, how do you reconcile the bigotry described in the Old Testament with the supposed message of equality and love in the New Testament? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think in many ways, it's a, um, it's a question that reflects popular characterizations more than anything else. Um, Jesus is not a sort of fluffy teddy bear who's like, let's just be groovy hippies about everything. He's the one talking about judgment, probably more than anyone else in the Bible. He's the one talking about the moment in which um, there is the ultimate writing of every wrong. Um, and that, by the way, is one of the things that in history has made a difference. So today we look at images of, of sort of hellfire and judgment. And we think, oh, gosh, that's very exploitative. At the time, and again, you can read Larry Seedentop on this, at the time in the medieval world, that was profoundly democratic because it was saying, even if you're a serf, even if you're at the bottom of the ladder, what you do matters to God. It's not going to be lost forever. You and your soul are precious to God right? Just because you're not the Lord of the land does not mean that God doesn't care about you. Um, so Jesus has a message that is 
sometimes terrifying to those who want to turn themselves against him. And on the flip side, the Old Testament is full of teaching about love. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. That, that stuff Jesus quoting from the Old Testament, he's not making it up himself, even if he combines it in, in very new and, and, and wonderful ways. Um, okay, right, so more specifically about the bigotry in the Old Testament. And I think this is a hard question because bigotry is one of those words that covers a lot today. And I, if only we were doing this in person, you could tell me, oh, I mean this, and I could have a whack at it. But let me have a go. Most of the time when people talk about bigotry in the Bible, two things are going on. Either they're talking about stories in the Bible where people do unacceptable things. And most of the time, those things are not commended by God as good. Um, you have terrible things that happen in the pages of the Bible, but they are not prescriptive, i.e. they're not saying, go do this. They're descriptive. They're saying, this is what happens when human beings who've turned away from God um, put themselves at the center. Secondly, a lot of the time, people are looking at laws um, that feel bigoted, that treat women differently, that talk about slavery, all these things. And they think to themselves, this, this is unacceptable. And uh, now the slavery question is really interesting. One I've been thinking about it a lot recently. Uh, slavery in the ancient world is just nothing like the slavery of modernity and the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, they're not utterly different, but they are different enough that it's important to, to recognize that. Um, but here's a critically important insight we get from the Bible. The law of the Old Testament, while intended by God, full of goodness and riches, is not his final word for his perfect world. Rather, it is his word for a broken world addressed to that particular people in the space that they are. So two um, things will help us to see this. There's a moment where Jesus is talked um, to about divorce and he's told uh, basically don't, don't divorce people lightly. Uh, and the people say to him, but hang on Jesus, if you're gonna say that, why did Moses give us these laws about divorce? And Jesus says, because your hearts were hard. In other words, the law in the Old Testament is an accommodation to the brokenness of society. And so when you read things about uh, how people are treated, how women are treated, how slaves are treated, what you have to realize is this is not God saying, this is the bar, this is what I want the world to be like. If you want to see that, look at Jesus and the way he treats people. That's it, right? What the laws are saying is, in the mess that is our world, full of violence and brutality and exploitation, here is a law that will curb the worst excesses and ensure that a, a sort of modicum of justice obtains throughout society. And I don't want to be too down on the law. The Old Testament law gives us amazing um, attention to the poor and the outsider, which shapes our values today. That's a really important thing to see. Uh, you might have other more specific questions. Perhaps come back tomorrow night, text them in on the slide, and we'll have a go. That's a great response. And I have to say, on, in terms of that question, if it hasn't been fully answered or that there's other aspects and nuances to it that you want, Again, come back um, over the other nights and then please um, put them on the Slido. Also do fill in the contact form, do you ask them, get in touch with a member of the CU and go really further in depth and as far as you wanna go with them in that. And in terms of this sort of like the world being broken and this sort of uncleanliness to it um, that Niff was talking about, the Mondays with Mark courses, the third session of that um, will be going on a sort of similar topic around that and looking at sort of like the brokenness of, of the world that we live in. Um, so yeah, now getting on to our, our final question. Um, why choose Christianity instead of any other religion or belief? And then they're given the examples of say mm. Buddhism, fate, or then if you want to go out there, but 4D beings. <laughs> great, um, these, these are great questions. Um, I, I had a swing at this at one of our Q and A's, but the basic answer is um, Jesus offers something unique, something that uh, other religions aren't trying to offer. And it would be unfair to make all the religions the same. By the way, that's one of the worst things we do with religion in our, in our sort of circles. We kind of talk about them like they're all different kinds of device. Like some people are Apple people, some people are Windows people. Uh, that's not how it is with religions. They're so different and it doesn't do anyone any favors to treat them all like the same. You know, the Bible and the Quran are doing different things in Christianity and Islam. Um, Okay, so having got that um, out of the way, here are three things that are on offer with Jesus that are worth taking seriously. Uh, you've got a unique claim, I've said this before, but a claim of Jesus stepping into human history um, as one of us. He's not one of many religious leaders saying, I can show you the way to God. He's saying, I am the way to God, I am God. Um, that doesn't happen in any other religion. You don't have someone saying, I am the last and best word that God has to say, I am God come in person. Um, and that's important. No, no other religious figure speaks like that about themselves. Um, secondly, you've got a unique set of, um, I guess, bits of evidence to work with. These are historical claims that we're looking at tonight. That's just not the way other religions um, approach 
Let's say we're talking about avatars in Hinduism. I have Hindu friends. It doesn't trouble many of them that there isn't really historical evidence for many of the things um, in, in some of their, their, um, their sort of religious traditions like the Ramayana. That's, that's not something they spend their time trying to prove because Hinduism has a very different understanding of time and, and history. Um, Right, so it's, that's one important thing. Um, and finally, there's, and we'll talk about this a lot on Friday, there's a unique offer with Jesus. Only Jesus says that what it takes to get right with God is not a wage you earn, but a gift you receive. Now, this is not something where you have to climb the mountain up to him, but he comes down to you and pays the price for you. That is a revolutionary idea and it changes everything. Christians call it grace. The word for that is actually the, the same word as gift in the original language. And, and what it really means is that with God, you don't have to earn your way. You don't have to sort of pay your keep. He's so generous. He will do that for you because he wants to welcome you in. Um, that's why he'd be forgiving. So you don't have to spend your life paying off all your debts. Um, and that's why he can be so satisfying because he delivers on, on the goodness that we're longing for. He's a gift giving God who made everything freely. He didn't have to. He made it out of an overflow of love, just like he made you. And you and I will not find our completion and our wholeness until we discover that from him. And it won't be found in anyone other than Jesus, uh, because only he is the one come in person to give it to us, to be the gift of God to us. Great question. Mm, wonderful response. And again, um, the commonest theme of a lot of your answers has been it's all, it hinges on Christ. He is the center of this and it mm. hinges on him and the resurrection. So if that's, um, if you want to take anything, I guess, away from this is that look at Christ and his resurrection um, and his death on the cross and make, come to your conclusions on that. Um, and so if you've got any more questions, there's some wonderful questions on the slider that we ha unfortunately haven't been able to get um, around to just due to time. Do bring them again um, tomorrow and on Friday and to the Slido. Also, please fill in that contact form um, in the description. You can send questions in through there. We will do our best to get an answer back to you as well as possible. And then also, um, please then sign up to either Mondays with Mark. Um, we will have talks on what's your view of Jesus, um, Jesus calming the storm and his actions demanding a response, um, and also on um, everything being unclean and that uncleanliness coming from within. Yes. Um, and that will be going through Mark's Gospel. And also we have Curious Cafes as well, which will also be on Monday. Um, and that will be going through John's Gospel slowly, um, piece by piece, and analysing that and coming to your own conclusions there. Um, also, one-to-ones -one are always available whenever. Either get in contact with someone you know in the CU um, privately or fill in through the contact form and we'll do our best to get someone to you. I highly recommend that because that's a brilliant way to just get your specific questions that you have and just get straight into it and just know, um, get personal with someone and really get to know um, a Christian on a personal basis, which is always gonna be the best way to, to help get to your answers because only through, through that sort of relationship will you know what is best for the both of you to go through. Um, but yeah, um, thank you guys for coming. Um, thank you, Niv, um, for wonderful responses. Um, and I hope to see you all um, again tomorrow and on Friday. I won't be doing the Q and A at that point, um, but it'll be wonderful to see you again. Um, bye for now.